Imagine you are the emperor of a huge empire in crisis. You are surrounded by countless tribes, kingdoms, empires, who all in one way or another want to plunder your cities, conquer your territory or even destroy you. Now imagine that you have to defend that vast empire with hundreds of thousands of men that have to be permanently stationed at the borders just to protect that vast empire against incursions of various enemy tribes. Now imagine that despite all these efforts, Germanic tribes still time and time again would have managed to storm these fortifications, to penetrate deep into the territory of your empire, to sack and to plunder your cities and to do that with ever greater ferocity. What would you do? What would you do if your empire would see a declining population after many decades of brutal diseases that had killed millions, after rampant inflation that had reduced the purchasing power of your currency so that recruiting new soldiers was getting ever more expensive? You try to think of the most economical way possible to defend your empire. What better way then as to let those Germanic tribes, those barbarians, fight each other? So you start recruiting more and more of these barbarians, making them an integral part of your army, because they are cheaper. You start relying more and more on them, as the fighting power of your own population is dwindling ever more rapidly, since they demand a lot more money to risk their lives. You let barbarians fight other barbarians. And you are content. Things are going well, it seems. It indeed seems that you are a genius. You have managed to defend your empire while letting your enemies fight each other. Until suddenly it doesn't work anymore. The system starts going bad. And in the end, this very system that was meant to protect your empire suddenly contributes massively to its downfall. This, dear friends of Roman history, is what happened to the Western Roman Empire. But why? What went wrong? When the Roman Empire reached its full extent, it became clear that it was a monumental task to just protect its stupendously long borders. From the cold highlands of northern Britannia, to the border of the Danube, to the eastern border of the eternal enemy Persia, simply just defending this empire required an incredibly high amount of manpower. Half a million men, about 400 to 600,000 were necessary at all times in order to protect the empire effectively from all the enemies that constantly surrounded it. However, despite that incredible manpower and despite thousands of kilometers of forts, walls, garrisons, watchtowers, ditches and other defensive features, enemies still manage time and time again to breach them. This first happened in the 160s and 170s AD after an extremely aggressive virus caused a disastrous pandemic in the Roman Empire, killing possibly about 10% of the population. This led to a manpower shortage and the empire had to look for new recruits at the borders. So already in that time, many outsiders were started to be recruited, especially from the Danube border at Dacia, in order to make up for that deficit. Then from the 230s into the 280s AD, so for half a century, enemy tribes of the empire yet again managed to storm the border fortifications, but this time even more severely. And again the cause had been a pandemic in the Roman Empire that had killed millions, but this time accompanied by civil wars and a breaking up of the Roman Empire. This crisis was even more dangerous than the second century one, because the empire almost fell. It became quite clear that protecting the Roman Empire the way it had been done before, by recruiting natives at the borders and making them auxiliary troops, so basically aids of the legions didn't work anymore. The distinction between legions and auxiliary troops had blurred anyways in the 3rd century. Non-Italians could now become Roman citizens after the Edict of Caracalla in 212 AD and so it was clear that the old system of a professional paid purely Roman army protecting the borders simply didn't work anymore. Scholars estimate that the late Roman Empire in the 4th and 5th century had about 10 or possibly even 15% less population 
than the early Roman Empire of the 1st and 2nd century during its peak. But meanwhile, the Germanic tribes had increased in size also by 10 to 15 percent, giving them now a greater manpower advantage. Also, the Germanics fought for sport, it was part of their culture, but the Romans had a professionally paid army. On top, this army demanded pay in order to stay loyal. If they became dissatisfied, they became prone to rebel and devastating civil wars were the result. So therefore, in the late 200s AD, but ever more so in the early 300s, the first large-scale recruitings of Germanic mercenaries started in order to solve peace problems. The logic was the following. These tribes were fierce fighters. Through centuries of friendly but also war contact with the Romans, they had become formidable fighters both in tactics and equipment, and they were cheaper than native Roman soldiers. In one of Emperor Valentinian III's laws from 440 AD, we can get a glimpse of how much cheaper they actually were than native Romans. Namely, one barbarian mercenary cost the state 5 gold solidi per year, solidi being the gold coins of that era, whereas a Roman legionary would have cost the state 30 solidi per year, a factor of 6 difference. So therefore, what better way to protect Rome than to let the barbarians fight for Rome and fight against other barbarians while being cheaper than regular Romans? This sounded like an excellent idea at the time. Hence, Constantine already recruited massive numbers of Franks after having defeated them in 306 and 307 AD. They became foreign soldiers in the service of Rome, so-called foiderati federate or allied soldiers, so to speak. And this system worked magnificently for a long time. Those cheaper soldiers became more and more prevalent, the fighters of choice if you will, and already by the 350s AD it was actually hard to tell a Roman army apart from an enemy Germanic one, as stated by Ammianus Marcellinus, who accompanied the Emperor Julian on many of his campaigns. On one such occasion, the inhabitants of a Roman city in Gallia barred themselves inside upon seeing Julian and his quote-unquote Roman army arrive, thinking them to be barbarian attackers. So therefore the lines between Roman soldiers and Germanic soldiers already had begun to blur. Hello dear friends of late Roman history, it's me, Sebastian, the creator and the person behind Majorianus. I apologize for this brief interruption, but I wanted to ask for your help to support Majorianus and to support the channel so that we can keep Majorianus a channel about late Roman history. As you know, the YouTube algorithm is often not very kind to niche topics such as late Roman history and therefore I really need your support in order to keep Majorianus the way it is, to keep it a channel about late Roman history so that we can continue to explore this most fascinating era of the late Roman Empire and so that we won't have to turn Majorianus into a mainstream history channel. Thanks for considering to support me via Patreon or via a YouTube membership. I cannot thank you people enough, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Majorian himself would be proud. Thank you friends of late Roman history and back to the video. The Foiderati system worked magnificently well, which is one of the reasons why things in the 4th century actually looked better for the Roman Empire than in the 3rd. But then at some point in the late 4th century, this system that had worked quite well for a century started going bad. Why? Well, first of all, there was the following problem. While the barbarian recruits seemed cheap on paper, with Valentinian III's law telling us that they were six times cheaper, in reality, that might have been an illusion. Archaeological excavations across Europe have found that many of the gold coins that the Germanic Foiderati received as pay did not re-enter the Roman money supply, meaning that once the Germanics received their pay, these Roman coins remained in the Germanic lands east of the Rhine and north of the Danube. And these coin findings start getting out of hand with emperors from the 4th century, showing that many gold coins started being lost when the Germanic recruiting started more strongly. But what was the consequence of that? Well, the consequence was twofold. The obvious one is that the Germanics didn't pay taxes to the Roman Empire. 
there was no control tax collection in the Germanic territories and so the coins were effectively really lost for Rome. And if you continue losing precious metal, gold, silver and copper from which to make new coins, it has another consequence. You try to make up for that loss by ensuring a continued output from the mines. However, many of the old gold and silver mines from previous centuries had by that time been depleted. So the gold and silver output in the late Roman Empire was lower than in the 1st and 2nd centuries AD. Therefore, what do you do? That is correct, you start reducing the gold and silver content in the coins even more. But the Romans were not stupid and immediately realized that there were coins now in circulation with varying gold or silver content. And of course they treated the ones with higher content as being worth more. This created effectively inflation. The purchasing power of the coins was reduced. This of course in turn meant now that recruiting Roman soldiers was next to impossible because they were not super motivated to risk their lives for inferior coins. And so basically there remained only foederati that were still willing to risk their lives for inferior coinage. However, it is quite clear that they were also not stupid and certainly also demanded a pay raise to make up for the loss of coin quality. And so we see the problem. While the foiderati seemed cheap on paper, the long term cost of foiderati might have actually been higher for the empire. It created a great fiscal burden through loss of tax revenue and through inflation. But even so, it continued working for decades until in the 370s it started going bad when many Goths started entering the Roman Empire from Dacia over the Danube River. In the Battle of the Frigidus River in 394 AD, the Emperor Theodosius famously and ruthlessly used his Gothic foederati as cannon fodder, so to speak, sending them as the first attack wave and letting them die by the thousands while trying to save Roman lives and keeping the Romans in reserve. It is no coincidence that immediately after the Battle of Frigidus, the Goths rebelled under their leader Alaric and that is when the problem started getting out of hand since it was the very same Alaric who sacked Rome itself 15 years later. And scenes like these would become the norm rather than the exception. Already by the later 300s, Germanic chieftains would manage to ascend the ranks of the Roman hierarchy and become so powerful that they would end up being sometimes more powerful than the Roman Emperor himself. Already in 392 AD, the Frank Arbogast had become supreme general of the Western Roman Empire, the so-called Magister Militum, overshadowing the Emperor Valentinian II in power who committed suicide in desperation and even choosing the next Western Roman Emperor. But while many times these Magistri Militum were loyal to Rome and probably saw themselves as Romans, sometimes they were not. Arbogast probably still chose as what he saw best for the Western Roman Empire and his successor Flavius Stilico, who was of Vandal origin as well. Even Flavius Aetius, who most likely had at least partial Germanic roots, the general behind the victory against Attila the Hun, did what he thought was best for Rome. But even then, this created animosity with the emperor and already beginning with Arbogast, it was either killing the emperor or being killed by him. The Frankish Magister Militum Arbogast was defeated by Emperor Theodosius. The next Magister Militum Stilico was killed by the Western Roman Emperor Honorius. The Magister Militum Aetius was killed by Valentinian III. And then in the end, this system had degenerated so much that someone like Rikimer was allowed to become supreme general of the Western Roman Empire, someone who, as it appears, was oftentimes more loyal to his Germanic kinsmen than to the Western Roman Empire. Rikimer had countless capable emperors and generals of the Western Roman Empire killed, greatly destabilizing it while being always very lenient to his kinsmen, the Visigoths and the Burgundians. But while we can blame Rikimer's certainly brutal character all we want, the foundation for the rise of Rikimer had been laid a hundred years before his time already. Valentinian II had committed suicide because, or was possibly even killed by Arbogast, more than 60 years before Rikimer rose to power. 
The precedent had been laid and so Rikima was just the final manifestation of the problem of Germanic chieftains with their own loyalties rising to the most powerful military positions of the Western Roman Empire. And Rikima did his very best to weaken Rome while strengthening his Visigothic and Burgundian friends. Basically by that time the Germanic Foederati system had gone so bad that a traitor had managed to subvert the Western Roman Empire. Another problem was that the Foederati oftentimes saw their obligation only towards a certain emperor or general. So for instance they would see themselves as Foederati of the general Constantius III or of the general Aetius. But as soon as such important persons died or were killed, the Germanics did not see themselves as Foederati anymore, since their allegiance in their eyes had depleted with the death of their respective commanders or emperors. And this is one of the reasons why we oftentimes, in the history of the late Western Roman Empire, see aggressive territorial expansion of the Germanic tribes when a Magister Militum or an emperor died or had been killed. This was especially visible after the deaths of Aetius and Valentinian III and after Emperor Majorian had been killed by the traitor Rikimer. All these times the Federates saw their agreement with that specific person ended and so they expanded aggressively. But even then there were still many Foederati loyal to Rome, making the whole situation of course very complicated. Sometimes there was even the paradoxical situation that Romans fought for the barbarians and the barbarians fought for Rome. That is how weird it had become in the later 5th century AD of the Western Empire. The Eastern Roman Empire however managed to rid itself of the Germanic influence first when the Constantinopolitans rebelled against the Goths in 399 and 400, expelling them from Constantinople and then later when the Emperor Leo I had the Germanic Magister Militum Aspar killed in 471. But the West didn't manage to rid itself of the Germanic subversion and by the 470s the state finances had been ruined through Germanic annexations of state territory and of the resulting declining tax revenue. Therefore at some point the Western Roman Empire could only afford to hire Foederati regular Roman units probably didn't even exist anymore after the 460s AD in noteworthy numbers. And then in the end it was the leader of a Germanic Foederati unit of Heruli mercenaries who defeated the last Roman Magister Militum Flavius Orestes and deposed the Western Roman Emperor Romulus Augustus in 476 AD. And so the Foederati system of recruiting Germanic soldiers as mercenaries in the service of Rome started off like an excellent idea. It allowed the Roman Empire to flourish in the 4th century AD, allowed it to continue existing for 200 years longer in the West after the disaster of the crisis of the 3rd century when it had almost fallen. But that system got successively out of hand. The financial burden was higher than initially thought, greatly contributing to ruining the state finances of the Western Roman Empire, which didn't have such rich provinces like the East. And the loyalties of the Germanic soldiers varied greatly, from fiercely loyal to Rome to outright traitors, which then culminated in someone like Rikima, the traitor of traitors, becoming general of the Western Roman Empire and thus sealing the fate of the West. But in the East, the Foederati system continued, it was brought under control and by the 6th century the distinction between Foederati and regular Roman units had almost disappeared in the Eastern Roman Empire. So it turns out that for the Eastern Roman Empire the Foederati system actually worked quite well after initial problems and later even became an integral part greatly contributing to the far longer survival of the Eastern Roman Empire as compared to the West. We will talk more about how the East managed to turn the Foederati system to their advantage in another video of course. So as so many things Roman, the Foederati system was sometimes a great boon for Rome, bringing it many victories, helping it to survive 200 years longer in the West, but especially later on creating more and more problems also in the West, which never managed to get the Foederati completely under control as the East would manage during the course of the 5th century AD.
So as so many things in Rome and the Foidenati system was sometimes a great boon for Rome, bringing it many victories, but especially later on creating more and more problems, especially in the West, which never managed to get their Foidenati completely under control, as the East would manage during the course of the 5th century AD. And so while the East endured, aided by the Foiderati, the Western Roman Empire, on the other hand, was ended by Herulian Foiderati under their chieftain Uruakar. And please like and subscribe so that you won't miss any future videos on the fascinating era of the late Roman Empire. And I would especially like to thank our new Sol Invictus supporters, Ulf Hednir117 and Titinozan. Thank you so much, Ulf Hednir117, for supporting Majorianus in such a generous way. And thank you so much, Titinozan, for returning as Sol Invictus and for your continued generous support of Majorianus. I cannot thank you both enough. And I would, of course, like to thank everyone who is supporting Majorianus in any form, be it through Patreon, YouTube membership, or through a PayPal donation. Thank you for supporting Majorianus so that I can keep this a channel only about late Roman history. And if you want to learn about why Rikima was such a traitor, you can watch this video in the upper right corner. But if you want to learn more about the late Roman army itself, you can watch the other video in the lower right corner. I say thanks again to all friends of Roman history, gratias Tibiago and bene valete.